Hello everyone, I'm Danny Cohn. To celebrate Ethan Freeman's 65th birthday, I've put together this short documentary from interviews for Behind the Mirror of Music and some very rare moments from his career that I hope you will enjoy. In love with all things art, music and theatre from a very young age, Ethan always knew he wanted to be on stage performing. When did you know you wanted to be in a musical theatre? I mean, I always had a suspicion. <laughs> um, I started doing my first little bits uh, in an amateur theatrical operetta company that my parents were involved in. Um, and I did my first musical at a, a summer camp up in the Berkshire Mountains in upstate New York when I was um, 11 with a 16-year-old director by the name of Harvey Firestein, oh. um, who uh, directed me in a production of You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, and in a, in a barn theater at the camp. And uh, the, I think... Some people have heard of him. He's gone on to yes. do a few interesting things. <laughs> um, so uh, our worlds collided back when I was 11 and he was 16 and he was my bunk counselor. Um, and I think I went when I was 13, I'd, I'd done two leading roles in new musicals that my elementary school, my primary school music teacher had written and produced in our school. I played a version of the Pied Piper of Hamelin. And now this year, hopefully, I will finally be able to go and play in Hamelin uh, and uh, a, a version of uh, the tale of Rip Van Winkle, which is a well-known American story from the pre-colonial, from the colonial era. I played Rip, who sleeps for 20 years and wakes up and everything has changed around him after the revolution. It's a very well-known American tale. Um, but when I was 13, I went to a, a music and arts summer program and uh, I was in the drama and theater uh, group and we did about 30 shows in six weeks. It was a great experience. But I think that summer we also went to see the musical Pippin on Broadway. And I'd seen a couple of shows already in my during my childhood. I think I'd seen 1776 and several other shows on Broadway growing up. but. You know, at 13, 14, I was beginning to feel like I was growing up and becoming a teenager. And we went and, and saw that show and it just turned me on completely to the idea of doing that. It really, really gave me a, a charge and sort of had that epiphanal moment where I said, that's what I want to do. And uh, I then got distracted by a fairly long period of wanting to be an opera singer. Uh, and studying in New York and at college and in the whole period in Vienna. Um, but I always had musical theater as a whole somewhere in the back of my mind or deep in my, in my creative heart somewhere. And so when the chance came to realize uh, I was going to be a cat rather than Luciano Pavarotti or whoever, <laughs> I jumped at the chance and uh, started my career as a musical theater performer in musicals. I mean, everything for me is musical theater, opera, rock operas, whatever, but, but uh, a musical where you're using all of your abilities to move and act and sing. Um, and Cats, obviously, I also had to sing operatically, so it was uh, the perfect fit. And that led to Phantom, and that led to everything else we did. Ethan's first professional stage role was in a legendary production of Leonard Bernstein's Mass. Mass in 1981 at the Kennedy Center in Washington was my first job, my first professional, real professional engagement right out of college. I was chosen to do the show by the musical director, John Malcheri, who was one of Leonard Bernstein's main protégés over the years. Um, who was the head of the music department at my university, or head of the opera department, and I studied with him, and 
I was uh, selling shoe, women's shoes on Fifth Avenue as a job job that summer and was very gratified to get a call to come in and audition for him and Tom O'Horgan, the director, the director of the original production of Hair. And uh, I went in the next day to the Minskov Studios and sang Impossible Dream and got the job, um, which was starting the next day. So <laughs> or I, I was actually jumping in from someone who had canceled out of the show as one of the street chorus soloists. I think I was pretty much the youngest in the company, along with one other female colleague. And, you know, the next day I came in and started my professional career in a production that Lenny himself then eventually uh, was, you know, directly involved with. So it was amazing, really. Um, my first big show full of professional, you know, colleagues who, were either already on Broadway or were about to be on Broadway in many cases. Um, and, you know, it's a combination of Broadway and classical singers and actors. Uh, so it was everything as a piece, as a vehicle for me, as a young classical musical opera singer, you know, everything I could possibly have dreamed of. Uh, production for dancers, singers, actors, uh, orchestra, band, chorus, boys chorus, you know, everything was there. Um, so there I was right in the middle of things. Um, and uh, I still every now and then I'll, I'll look at a couple of clips on YouTube of that production because it was televised on public broadcasting um, later in that that fall. And uh, we had, I think, two and a half or three weeks of rehearsal in New York and then went down to Washington and, uh, you know, started my life in on the stage. And, you know, it was uh, great observing so many good professional people and being part of that team was uh, an awesome first experience for a young performer. Following this production, Ethan moved to Vienna to further his singing education. Soon he was performing in various stage shows, including Cats. Then came auditions for The Phantom of the Opera. auditioned in Vienna. What was that like? And did you know anything about the story back then? I think I had actually read the original novel at some point much earlier in my life. Um, and by that time I was, sorry, I want to, I'm doing something which I don't want that to be. Okay. Um, I think I had been able by then to familiarize myself with some of the songs from the show. Um, the show had opened in London already. And when we found out that uh, auditions were happening for the Vienna production, I was doing Cats at the time in Hamburg. And uh, I was able to get hold of Music of the Night. And, and uh, I think the original London recording had already been released. And I knew Steve Barton a bit, uh, who was uh, obviously playing the original Raoul and then had gone on to New York. Um, so I was able to familiar familiarize myself a little bit with how the musical was uh, constructed musically. And I probably heard most of the original cast recording by that time I auditioned, I think anyway, if memory serves me. <laughs> Thank you. 
Over the years, Ethan would perform the role nearly 2,000 times in Vienna, London's West End, Toronto and Essen, Germany. Taking many cues from the original novel by Gaston Leroux for his portrayal of Eric, soon earned him the nickname the Leroux Phantom with fans. I definitely wanted to find a character who was as close to the original Phantom source character as possible um, within the constraints, probably the wrong word, uh, within the parameters that were set by Andrew and Hal and Gillian. Um, I definitely wanted to get as close to a character who comes from the romantic period, not, not in the sense of love romance, but in the, in the sense of the idea of one being redeemed by love, um, which I thought as, as in the passage of, of the Phantom that you sent me to read, uh, is very clear that, that Eric is for me redeemed in a very romantic sense. Uh, although obviously in the musical and in Hal's conception of the musical, it has a lot of physical and, and sensual um, uh, content. Um, I also wanted to capture a 19th century Phantom um, rather than only the 20th century phantom. Um, because to me that made this character in the story more universal. And uh, if, if that is the case that I've known as the, the, LaRue, the LaRue phantom among whoever, <laughs> then I, I guess I was doing my job the way I wanted to, which is nice. Ethan was amazing. He was, um, he was so... Uh involved with the character I remember on that very very first performance he was even off stage he was Eric I remember him putting his cape around me before um we climbed the the travelator stairs for the Phantom of the Opera duet after I'd gone through the mirror um and take it taking you from the dressing room and I remember him putting putting his cape around me and no mic, it wasn't on mic, but he was so involved in the character. And he'd say, come into the, come into my lair, my darling. And it was there. And I was like, oh my God, he's so into it. It was just, it was a whirlwind. I loved working with Ethan. He was great fun because you were like, oh my God, he's so there. He's so in it. <laughs> he still is when I interview him. Um, he always goes, it's like we are talking to Eric about his life. It's totally involved, absolutely. Things, things that I remember about Ethan, I remember taking his hand in the dressing room before going downstairs and saying, have a brilliant one tonight. And his hands were freezing. And I said to him, oh my goodness, Ethan, you're so cold. And he went, I've lowered my body temperature in line with that of the phantoms. And I was like, oh my God, this is fabulous. <laughs> and so I, just, I really remember things like that.
there been a difference for you between seeing the, the Viennese, German and English translation? Uh, yes, um, it made a reasonable amount of difference to the vocally, technically. I mean, singing German is different than singing English. It's, um, you have to obviously renegotiate things. But on the other hand, I started off in the Vienna production doing the show in German. And although I had learned music of the night, obviously in English and a couple of other parts of the show in English for the auditions, I actually performed the show first in German. So making the switch back to English when I arrived in London was actually much easier. And even now when I sing music of the night in German, I will sometimes practice it in English to help me find my way again so that I can find my way back into the German <laughs> version because it, the, the vowels sit a little differently in the throat. The consonants are different. They, there are more of them. Um, it is, you need to make more pronunciation stops in German before vowels, the so-called glottal stop, which you don't in English. You can sing, um, nighttime sharpens, heightens each sensation. In German, you would have to say each, each, rather than sharpens each sensation. It's often more, a little more difficult to sing a phrase with a legato line in German than it is in English because you have to take care of pronouncing the vowels to make sure they're understood. By popular demand, a long video of Ethan discussing everything Phantom will be uploaded sometime in the future. In between his various Phantom runs, Ethan also created the role of the Beast for the European premiere of Disney's Beauty and the Beast. The Beast is often compared to Eric the Phantom, though Ethan disagrees with this notion. No, I think they're too... Oh, well, okay, they're obviously both traumatized. They're both very egoistical in their own way. But perhaps there are more points of similarity. And if I thought about it for a longer time, I might find them. But for me, the beast is much more uh, symbolic of <clears throat> what happens to men when they grow up. When they move from being self-centered teenagers to becoming, or children perhaps in a way, to becoming, uh, as you say in German, I wanted to say, mature. Um, for me, it's about a man's or a male's learning to become, a boy learning to become a man, basically, and learning to love as the main impulse for that transition, for that change from a wild beast into the prince that he is supposed to be. Um, so I don't see too many points of connection with the Phantom. Um, I think the beast is traumatized and lonely and feels unloved, but he does have friends. He does have a group of actually loving objects <laughs> around <laughs> him who support him. And I think that's a fairly essential difference between the two characters as far as their isolation <clears throat> and loneliness is concerned.
Another big West End role for Ethan was the role of Javert in Le Miserable, a role that earned him another nickname, namely Most Emotional Javert on the West End. Um, I was actually playing Phantom in Toronto at the time and um, got a call, or my agent probably got a call from Cameron's office and asked if I would be interested in auditioning for John Caird in New York for the West End production because they were looking um, for uh, Anu Javert to start, I think it was the 12th year of the production, the, coming up to the 12th year anniversary. And John was in New York and I was in Toronto and I flew down for a day, took a show off and went into a studio in New York and sang for him and got the part. That's how it <laughs> worked. And I was scheduled to end my run in Toronto anyway. Um, I guess it was late that fall and because Peter Carey had already been booked. Um, and uh, and I said, oh, it's a wonderful chance now because uh, I was up for the part in Vienna years before and ended up getting the alternate Phantom instead and knew that having waited a number of years was much better for me in terms of being a, a good Javert and uh, was very pleased to be able to move from uh, Toronto with a couple of weeks notice back to London and uh, take over the role there from Hardy Rudolz. Uh, my friend who, who was uh, one of the original German Javert's and uh, he was leaving and uh, and I was able to go in and move into the show in London in, uh, you know, it wasn't a new production, obviously, but uh, it was getting a freshen up for the 12th anniversary and, um, you know, had uh, obviously some great partners on stage and, uh, you know, what an honor. Chauffeur is said to be um, the most emotional one ever in uh, Chauffeur's suicide. Did you do that consciously? Mine is? Oh, yes. I, um, I think when you're about to kill yourself on stage, it's pretty emotional. <laughs> I, 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 I know that some performers who play Javert do not probably go as far as I wanted to in terms of having a breakdown there and questioning their rigid view of the universe. But for me, uh, it was the crux of, you know, what do you feel like when you're, you discover that your entire view of your philosophy of life is, has been basically wrong um, to the point that you cannot live anymore to the point where you, have to take your own life for me that denotes a certain amount of of uh, emotional insecurity and collapse and that's obviously something i tried to transport in preparation for killing myself so uh, for me that was obviously the necessary degree of emotion and and the production supported me in that decision so uh, i don't really compare myself to anyone else specifically but um for me it was important to go far in that as far as that's concerned emotionally yes apparently it was uh, at one point i found this that um a woman in the who was in the audience said does he oh my god does he need psychological help or something like that <laughs> i think everyone in our business needs, needs psychological help at some point um well, uh, I, I don't know. Um, obviously, uh, if someone, <clears throat> if you're viewing someone who's considering suicide, that should, in fact, for me, be the impression you get of them is that they need psychological help. Because if they didn't, they probably wouldn't be about to jump into the Seine. Which is, as I was in Paris recently, um, jumping off a bridge into the Seine would certainly demand a lot of pain, <laughs> put it that way. In order to make me jump off a bridge into the Seine, I would have to be emotionally a lot more desperate than I've ever been in my life, thank goodness. Right.
One of the biggest and most challenging roles for Eaton was creating the role of Jekyll and Hyde in Europe in 1999. What was um, doing Jekyll and Hyde like? Um, very difficult, uh, physically, vocally, exciting. Um, probably the biggest challenge of my career, I would say. Um, it's certainly the hardest role in my repertoire um, just because you're working hard and singing hard the entire show and um, I think playing the role was more enjoying for me than singing the role um, because it was vocally a very big challenge and sometimes I had the feeling that, you know, particularly after four or five shows in a week, that that I was not successfully uh, surviving the challenge. <laughs> um, and I think that uh, looking back, um, it took me quite a while to figure out how I really should sing the role. And particularly the division of the two characters and uh, sometimes I was good sometimes I wasn't so good um, so there was always a certain amount of oh is it going to be a night where I'm on the mark where I'm where I'm on my game um, or am I going to struggle and that's not a great feeling but on the other hand when I I was on my game I think that uh, I was good in the part and it was a part which I really helped create very strongly for the German production anyway and uh, yeah I'm proud that I survived it <laughs> I think uh, Frank Wildhorn said to me very truthfully on the night of the premiere uh, don't worry at some point everyone runs into the wall uh, with the part um, where you just have to, you hit the wall and you have to take a little time off and recalibrate and, and regroup and uh, go back and, and economize more. And, you know, it's a, a role where you really want to give everything you have every single show and you have to give everything you have every single show. And that is a stressful situation, especially for the vocal cords.
perform the role of Che in Evita in two different productions, returning to the show a few years later to perform the role of Peron. What are your memories on working on the show? Ah, um, various. Um, I've done three different productions in two different roles. Um, it was always with Che Guevara. You have such a huge variety of choices and directions to go with a part, depending on, on the director, depending on the setting. I mean, the first time I played Che, it was on a gigantic cathedral staircase um, in, in open air production in Schwäbisch Hall in Germany with about 50 stone stairs leading up to a church in the main plaza in the town. Um, so that had its own very specific physical demands. You had to be a, a master of moving up and down and sideways and, and uh, diagonally up these very steep stairs without falling on your face or falling on your head. And uh, so that was a very specific challenge, but one which uh, I found very fitting for the part of someone who's basically flitting around, uh, performing uh, different parts within the part, um, being taking on different characters, and then being able to have a commanding view down on the audience was also quite helpful uh, with Che because you also, when you're sort of at the top of the stairs, uh, looking down, you, you knew that you were on almost like on a gigantic cinema screen um, rather than being on a flat surface looking up at the audience. Um, so uh, that was a very interesting introduction to the show. Um, obviously, I've had, you have to have great colleagues, both in the ensemble and in the other principal roles, um, because you're interacting with everyone constantly the whole show. Um, I think the music is great. I think the concept is great. Um, I think the various choreographies that I've seen and been involved in with the show have been, you know, tremendous amount of fun from tango dancing uh, to all the running around that you do uh, with, you know, in, in conjunction with, with the dancers. Um, it's a a, a tough but very enjoyable part. And then playing Peron uh, in a later production, also in open air, um, was a different experience than playing Che, um, but also one that, you know, de demands concentration and subtle, a subtle acting performance. I think uh, playing a a powerful dictator um, is different than playing the the dynamic revolutionary, but is actually no less difficult. Probably it's more difficult, actually, because you have to protect power out of stillness and control. Is it strange to um, see someone else play a role when you are playing a different part? Um, I mean, no, in the particular case, it wasn't. First of all, uh, when I played Peron, my Che was Drew Sarich, who was a you know good friend of mine, and completely different type of performer, gave a completely different performance, and uh, certainly one which stood for itself and was. Uh, so different from me in every single aspect that I wouldn't even have really thought of comparing how he performed the role to the way I had performed the role. So um, that was the, an advantage of it being a different production. But, and no, he was really good, so it wasn't strange. <laughs> what other similarities between uh, Che and Luciani do you think? I think that um, to a certain extent, um, Lucchini was a little bit modeled uh, as a role type on Che's, the aspect of Che as both a narrator of the piece and a sort of uh, 
a Nebendarsteller in, in, in the life of Evita. Well, actually, he, Lucchini was obviously more of a part of Elizabeth's life and fate and history than Che, was, who was never really directly involved with Eva Peron specifically. Um, but the idea of, of a rocky, popping, pop singing, rock singing narrator uh, perhaps was used by Kunz and Levi when they created Lucchini. Uh, a useful device. Uh, and as we got closer and closer to the premiere of Elizabeth and needed to work on and develop certain transitions in the show, they were able to use Lucchini's flexibility as a performer and position as an outstanding or an outside observer of Elizabeth's life to help make some of those transitions work better while the set was changing, this, that, and the other thing. And um, the role just kept getting bigger and bigger as we got closer to the opening. <laughs> and so there are certain stylistic uh, similarities between the two parts. And it, as it happened, I played Che right after I played Lucchini. So for me, obviously, there were even more parallels present at the time in 1993 when I first played Evita. <laughs> The role of Shea is often compared to that other defining role of Ethan, Luigi Lucchini, a role Ethan created in Elizabeth Does Musical in 1992. What was it like to um, originate Luigi and Elizabeth? That was another awesome and in retrospect brilliant experience working on a world premiere with a creative team really fantastic. I mean, Harry Kupfer uh, was a really masterful director, um, dictatorial, but phenomenally creative with a tremendous understanding of human nature and how to portray that on stage. Um, he pushed me very hard. He gave me a lot of, lot of urging, I'll put it that way. <laughs> and really brought me up to another level, I would think, particularly in a role that was totally different from anything I had done before that. Complete, um, insane, crazy, violent rock singer. Um, it was also wonderful because I was able to bring a lot of aspects from my own life. I grew up in a an American town where a lot of Italians lived. I think that my town was at least 40% Italian. So I was able to bring my feeling of how Italian people are um, into the role and um, was able to give Luigi a certain Italianita um, that uh, I think suited him very well. Um, it was a wonderful physical part. I was able to, you know, continue to use all the physicality that had been part of doing Cats or doing Phantom um, and bring my whole body into the role. And I had to because that also freed up the voice to these high, rocky, screamy things. And um, it was a, just a wonderful character and fun to play and challenging. Um, we were had a different system of casting at that point, both 
Uwe Kröger, who was playing Death, and I playing Lucani. We had only Thomas Borchert as our cover. He sort of alternated in both parts. So we all three of us shared a dressing room <laughs> and all we had was each other. So um, if uh, two of us were sick, uh, we had a problem, <laughs> but it never happened. I was even allowed very gracefully by the management to go spend a week in Japan with uh, the New York Pops Orchestra on tour and Uwe and Thomas uh, held the fort during that time and the show went on. I don't think we ever, never, almost never did eight shows a week. That might have made it a little bit uh, harder to do that. But, uh, you know, that was uh, a, certainly uh, a, a casting situation that you would never have again anywhere in a large theater here or in London or New York. Obviously, there would always be more potential covers for a role available. But uh, I don't know quite how we got onto that. But yeah, but Lucani was you know, a great experience. Uh, and, and another great cast, obviously. And I had already known Pia for many years, or quite a few years before that. But uh, Uva and Victor and Andy and, and everyone else, we all became very close and uh, a very strong unit um, and obviously had to wade through the initial critical uh, appraisal of the piece but we knew that the audience was flipping out every night so we were not worried when the reviews at the beginning were harsh to say the word to say the least yeah. Over the years, Ethan performed in many amazing productions, often with close friend Pia Dawes. He created the German incarnation of Dracula. <laughs> Start in the German production of The Secret Garden. Now girls come who has her eyes, she has her eyes, she has my lilies, his eyes, those eyes that saw him happy long ago, those eyes that give him life and hope. And was Leopold Mozart in Mozart Does Musical, Jafar in Aladdin, and Sheriff of Nottingham in Robin Hood. Long John Silver in Treasure Island, pilot in various productions of Jesus Christ Superstar, among many, many more. In recent years, he created the role of Sherlock in Sherlock Holmes' The Next Generation, and this year starred as Reverend Shaw Moore in Footloose and as the creature in Young Frankenstein, a role he has truly loved to create and redefine. How do you approach um, the creature, the monster? Um, I try to approach him um, in a sort of a dual way. Obviously, you are there to play the comedy and one must um, devote oneself to finding everything that is going to get a laugh because that's sort of the rule but on the other hand i also try to take him seriously as a 
a human subject, a character who suddenly finds himself in a strange, gigantic new body um, with a, a childlike mentality to start with. And so I'm, I'm sort of looking at it as a sort of a traumatized child um, going through all sorts of really weird stuff. And I think that actually enables one to have a little bit of substance underneath the pure comedic level, which makes the role definitely more enriching to play and uh, to sense a development in the character from being this violent childlike giant to becoming a, 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 not only a man about town, as this song goes, and Mann von Kultur in German, but also at the end, he, after he has Frankenstein's brain transplanted into his brain, he also becomes a, a moral being uh, and, and a, a very mature adult. So I see parallels in the archetypical development from beast to prince, as you would see it in the Beauty and the Beast story of uh, a, a, a beast-like human being becoming a, a human being with nobility, with, with uh, good qualities. And uh, so I try to play that arc while trying to get all the jokes and do all the silly, silly body comedy and double takes. And that makes it all together a very enjoyable part to play. In recent years, Ethan has become known for another art form as well, painting. He has slowly been building a name for himself in the art world and has used his paintings often to raise money for charity. What inspires your artwork and what advice do you have for artists who'd like to branch out from a more realistic style and try abstract painting? A more realistic style? Okay, abstract and try abstract painting. Yes. Um, I wish I could answer that question well. I'm not sure I can. I think it sounds a bit like a cliche in the meantime, because I, I think my motivation in painting has something to do with my motivation for performing in general, which is I enjoy using part of myself to tell stories. I think we're storytellers. I think as actors, we're storytellers as our primary task, our primary um, raison d'être. Um, I think storytelling is an age old, ancient human ability that presumably no other animals have. Um, so it's one of the things that makes us human. And being able to tell the story with my voice has been the great gift of my professional life anyway. And try, I think that how I paint has something to do with that. But on the other hand, I also have always enjoyed seeing magical things somewhere in the back of my mind. Even as a child, I remember lying in bed and having little visions in my head um, of colors, of shapes, of kaleidoscopes uh, that has probably always been fascinating for me at some level. And I think that when I start a painting, I often don't know what I'm going to do. Um, I often just start working on something and let it happen. And that's something that I find I'm able to do with painting that you can't really do with an, performing a role or singing a song. You have many more guidelines and points that you have to uh, consider and beats you have to hit and you're telling basically someone else's story um, and trying to tell it in a very veracistic, truthful way. And with painting, I can really have a certain amount of freedom, as much freedom as my technical ability allows me. Um, <clears throat> and I would say my technical ability is uh, 
probably not that of a schooled trained artist, um, which I sometimes feel is limits me to a certain degree, but on the other hand, there's no reason not to work on something that to improve yourself. And I try to do that when I have time to work on some aspects of classical painting technique to try to pick up some of those pieces that I didn't get because when I was 12 or 13, I started doing theater and singing rather than painting and doing art, doing visual art. Um, so, and trying to find through the painting some path into my inner creativity. Exactly what's down there at the bottom of all that, I'm not sure myself. Um, as far as moving away from a more realistic style to a more abstract style, I would say try to unbind yourself from day-to-day -day visual reality and try to find uh, whatever it is. Uh, an abstraction is uh, a, a, a freeing from a visual reality, uh, I would say. Uh, so you can actually abstract something real or go into those hidden recesses of your mind where color happens, where fantasy happens. I mean, the, the sky is the limit. The, there's no path in, in abstract art that's wrong. Um, there may be wrong ways to sing, but there's no real wrong way to paint, as far as I'm aware of. Well, what is your greatest memory? Oh, God, I don't know. Um, of life on stage. Um, there are many. Um, I, I don't know. I'd, it would be maudlin to, or, or, or overly, perhaps pathetic, um, to say performing in Carnegie Hall um, with the New York Pops Orchestra doing the Phantom songs. Um, in that legendary concert hall for an audience in which included my mom, who was very sick at the time and passed away not too long thereafter. Um, that could be one of one of my many great memories, but uh, there have been a lot of them. Um, I don't know, carrying the Claire Moore, who was five and a half months pregnant across the stage to the boat. There are all sorts of you know, wonderful experiences that I've had on stage, off stage, meeting the women I've spent my life with. Um, obviously, the birth of my child uh, are, you know, belong to the most extraordinary memories of my life. Um, and I can't really single out anything much more than that. Do you have any hopes and dreams for your future in life and career? At this point, I am just happy to get from one week to the next. I don't mean to sound say that in a depressed sort of way. I just think that the world at the moment is uh, on such a strange and delicate knife's edge particularly in our professional world, that um, as athletes are prone to say, I'm just taking it all one day at a time. Um, obviously, I hope that my the world my children grow up in or grow up into will still have some resemblance to the pleasant world that I entered, but clearly a lot of the world is not a pleasant place. Um, a lot of people have very difficult lives and you all you can do is try to give them the best tools that you are able to as a parent and hope that they will eventually make their way as adults and at some point it becomes their path. Um, obviously I hope to 
live as long and fulfilling a life as I can and uh, enjoy life and um, not you know suffer grave debilitating illness and obviously see my loved ones spared that as well but you know those are the things that everyone hopes and dreams for and I think uh, there's nothing particularly um, novel about those hopes and dreams on my part and uh, you know as far as theater is concerned getting the last few good years out of theater business if possible would be nice while I still have the the drive and energy to do it and in the meantime you know work on painting and improving myself and uh, you know clearing up my apartment <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, today. You're welcome. Nice to chat with you, in fact. <laughs> Have a great night. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Best -bye. regards. Bye. Bye.